what I believe is the appropriate prayer for us Christians during Advent. It's actually found in the Thessalonian lesson. Will you look at that with me, please? <coughs> Paul offers this prayer for the Thessalonian church. He says in verse 12, May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. And then the next verse, May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. That's the heartbeat of what Advent is about. In other words, on the one hand, it holds up and celebrates an objective event that has yet to happen in history, meaning Jesus' visible return to earth. That's what's in front of us. He came the first time. We are now thinking about Advent. And of course, Advent means appearing, because we're thinking about not just getting ready to celebrate December 25th, which commemorates the birth of Jesus, his first appearing, but also thinking about when he will come and return. And we, as it were, live between the first coming and the second coming. Because we do live between the first coming and the second coming, life occasionally can be awful. The wonder of the scripture is that it is profoundly realistic. There is never a sense in the New Testament of somehow it being removed from what real life actually looks like. That on the one hand, there is the wonder of our relationship with God, and at the same time, there is also the difficulty of our circumstances. Um, anybody who comes to you and you ask them as a Christian, well, how are you doing? And they say, oh, I'm, I'm fine. You know that that's always partially true because they're a Christian. But you also know at the same time that there are parts of their life or the life of people that they know that's actually kind of a mess. Isn't that true? Not your head. I mean, that's, see, that's what real life is like. And so the question that Advent raises for us is in the midst of the fact that on the one hand we belong to Jesus, if we said yes to him, if we call him Lord, if we've been baptized, on the one hand, that's eternally true. He's committed himself to us without reservation. He says, I will never leave you or forsake you. Nothing can take you out of my hand. We belong to him. We know we're going to heaven when we die. And that he is in us and we are in him. And that that's never not true. Actually, no matter what's going on in our circumstances or no matter how we feel. You see, if you fall into the trap of somehow feeling that the caliber of your Christian walk is in any way related to how it is that you feel, you're just sunk. I mean, does it make sense for me to say that to you? Because our feelings come and go. Sometimes we feel great. But that could mean just because we've had a nice cup of coffee. Sometimes we can feel miserable because we ate something we shouldn't have the night before. You see, feelings can have all kinds of um, reasons for them that may or may not be related to our spiritual existence. It may say a lot about our bodily existence, but not necessarily our spiritual existence. You see, the promises of God to us as his people are never change. When he says never, as in I will never leave you or forsake you, there's no qualifier as in, well, I'm never going to leave you unless you do something really bad. That, you won't find that one in the New Testament. In other words, if we belong to him, if we have been joined to him, that is always true no matter what. So in the midst of all of that, it is eternally true that we are His. It is also true that in this life, it gets really hard sometimes. And so the challenge becomes, the question that in essence Advent puts in front of us, is how is it that we can live knowing that we are His, 
in the midst of what really can be really difficult church circumstances. That's really what it means to live between the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus as his child. I mean, if you read the lesson that Deacon Betty read about what it's going to be like before the return of Jesus, it's a horror show. It, it's a cliche to say it could be pulled out of the headlines, but it makes sense that there are connections. But the fact of the matter is, is that in the midst of us being faithful to Christ, the, the lives of those around us that we love and care for, and often ourselves, get worse sometimes instead of getting better. The life can really be difficult, and there are things that, and pain, real pain, that we go through for which we have no temporary answer. I mean, for example, you all heard, of course, about the policeman that was shot and killed in Colorado. A faithful, he was on the side of Planned Parenthood during the shooting. Faithful Christian man, an elder and a leader in his church, a dad, husband. There are no adequate answers for why that man was shot and killed. There aren't. Now what we can say, and that we would say to that family, is that is he in heaven right now? Absolutely. Does he know all the reasons for all that he endured, including his untimely death? Yes, he does. Paul says, then I shall know, meaning when he's face to face with Christ, then I shall know even also as I am known. But do we know that now? No. And unfortunately, it's the worst kind of, kind of platitudes, even though people mean, you know, well by it, for them to come up to the widow or the children and would say, oh, I guess God needed him right now, or something like that. I mean, that just would make you angry at God. I mean, it's a terrible thing to say. I mean, it, it is far more, I think, biblical and realistic in the midst of those kinds of untimely tragedies to love and care for people, to pray for them, and say, I'm going to be with you through this no matter what. And to say, just as clearly, God is not forsaken. But the why? We don't know. There's no Bible verse that you can point to that answers that question. Except that the Bible assumes that these things, things like this actually really happen. In other words, again, there's nothing unrealistic about what's going on in the Scriptures. So to live faithfully in the midst of genuinely uncertain circumstances requires a commitment on our part. And I want to talk a little bit about what that commitment looks like. Number one, it's a commitment to helplessness in the presence of God. You want to draw closer to God? You want to know more about His love? Part of that means getting in front of Him and saying, God, I just admit to you I don't have the answers. I, I don't know how to grow in my love for you. I mean, remember, that's the prayer. May your love increase. I don't know how to do that. God, I need you to begin to come and break in and do things for me that I cannot do for myself. You see, that's a commitment in essence, to helplessness before the presence of God. To be able to say to Him, there are things in my life that are bigger than I am. And I don't know how to handle them. I need you to begin to break through, change things in me that I cannot change in myself. Help me, God, to know more of your love. Because that's where it always starts. Remember, the, the epitome for Jesus is not the self-sufficient human being who can stand on his own two feet, the wise, which are adults. But rather, he says, unless you come to me as what? A little child. You see, it's the little child that doesn't know very much. It's the little child that knows that he or she needs the protection of his parents. It's the little child that knows that I have to rely on them even for food and clothing and shelter because I can't do that for myself. I'm not ready. And that is exactly the right posture for us before God. 
You see, it's, it's not a question of increasing our self-confidence. Instead, it's a question of increasing our level of helpless honesty in the presence of God. Do you hear the difference? It's extraordinarily important. Because if the Lord is near to those who call upon Him, if the Lord is the one who comes in the midst of our own helplessness to provide for all of our needs, if it is the Lord who fills us in the midst with our, His love, in the midst of our own confession of sin and brokenness, that's the place to be, especially in the times when we need Him. Or even more importantly, especially in the times when we think things are going pretty well. Because you never know when the circumstances are going to turn. It's just how it is. There is, in fact, a level of realistic <coughs> uncertainty about our circumstances that the Scripture profoundly understands. So that in the midst of what the prayer book describes as the changes and chances of this life, what holds us together is the fact that like a child, I know that God has my hand and that He will never let me go. And that even when I fight and don't want His hand, come on, let's be honest, aren't there times when it feels like that? Where I'd rather do what I want to do, thank you very much. <laughs> even then, just like a little child that we love and care for, you know, when the toddler gets very determined and goes, no, I'm not going to go that way. What does a parent do? A parent picks the child up. Right? Then say, okay, have it your way. Although sometimes that's not too bad if you just to scare the child a little bit. <laughs> so, so it is. You see, so it is because God understands the nature of our resistance. Because we it's it's the sin in us. We we want to be, you know, in charge. Making our decisions and taking responsibility for our lives. But the scripture invites us instead is into a place where we yield to Him. And where we confess our need of Him. And out of that, what the Lord inevitably does is not only draws us nearer to Him, He also invites us into a deeper relationship with one another. People who are in those kinds of similar places where on the one hand, yeah, we belong to God and we know that He loves us, but even though sometimes it doesn't feel like it, but I need other people to help me and pray for me through this. I loved it that your rector said at the beginning, I really want to thank you for the prayers that you offered for me and my family at the death of his sister. We need one another in the midst of these kinds of times. And prayer matters. Prayer deeply matters. Prayer, in fact, changes things in a very, very extraordinary way. And so... It's appropriate that we pray and stand with one another, but where we stand together is just to be able to join hands and say, let's be helpless in the presence of God together and ask God to come to our aid. Whether that becomes actually standing and praying for one another or just showing up with some food as a way of saying, I really care. We have some people today, one, Allison, who is to be baptized, and a group of people to be confirmed. In essence, all of the commitments that they're going to make as a part of the ceremony and the commitments that you will also reaffirm with them is a commitment to stay under the authority of God. And how you do that is by staying firm in the position of being helpless before Him and confessing your need and trusting that He really does have you by the hand. That's what it means to be a Christian. It doesn't mean circumstances always go the way you want. It doesn't mean that God always answers your prayers the way you like. It doesn't mean anything except that the Holy One of Israel is in your midst. That the God of the universe is filling you with His presence. That you are surrounded by angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. That you have a place in heaven when you die. That there is an eternal purpose that God is working out in and through you. Whether you feel like it or not, because your life is a divine appointment. All of that is gloriously and wonderfully true. And the way that is actualized in your life is not through resolution, but God, I need you, let's do this together, and here we go. That's what it means to be a Christian. 
That's what these are going to commit themselves to. That's what Advent invites us into. In this in-between time, between the birth of Jesus, His resurrection, and His coming again. So that in the midst of those times, when we see Him or not, whether we feel His presence or not, we know He's coming, and we're committed to Him, because we know that He will never let us go. Amen.